1 Corinthians chapter 16, let's pray. Lord, help us to finish well. In the midst of the craziness, Lord, we know that nothing's falling apart. It's all falling into place. And your perfect plan is being unfolded before the world for them to see. And our prayer and desire, Lord, is that we would put a smile on your face, bless you, and bless others. And so, Lord, we just pray for the power of the Holy Spirit to minister to our hearts today, to bring a message of encouragement, strengthening, and love. Bless this time, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, this whole letter has been like, kind of like the letter you don't want to get. It's been this corrective letter to let you know what you're not doing right. And though the Corinthians had exercising of the spiritual gifts probably more than any New Testament church, they had more problems probably more than any New Testament church. There was backbiting. There was gossiping. There was uh, sexual immorality. There was drunkenness. They were suing one another. They thought they were better than everybody else. I mean, I could go on and on and on. And so Paul spent this pretty much entire letter just straightening them out, correcting them, telling them what they needed to, be, to do. And then he, he gives the most important thing last, and we looked at that last week, the resurrection. That it had crept into the church that there was no resurrection. Paul had to straighten them out on that with infallible proofs and, and to tell them, listen, without the resurrection, you got no hope. We might as well pack it up and get out of here because there's no afterlife. If Jesus didn't raise from the dead, then you and I have no hope of being risen from the dead. You have no hope of eternity. You have no hope of anything. So you might as well just be like the Epicureans, he said. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die. But he lays it out in such a way that we understand because of what Christ did on the cross, the Father accepted that sacrifice, and the, and the proof of the acceptance was the resurrection. Jesus rose from the dead, so you and I will follow. And, and last week was like the mountaintop experience, wasn't it? I mean, we were talking about, you know, uh, the rapture of the church and the Lord descending with a shout, the, the sound of the archangel, the, the trump of God, and then us being caught up in the clouds with them, transformed from these earthly bodies to these new bodies, no more pain, no more suffering. We had this mountaintop experience. And then he closes the book with verse 1, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do I, to you. You're like, really, Paul? After all that really great stuff and that mountaintop experience, now you're going to talk about money? Now, money has always been a tough one for people. Um, especially in the church. And, and I totally understand because there's been such an abuse of giving, where we've seen these guys begging for money on TV, uh, making merchandise of people. Uh, you know, whenever you watch a program or listen to a program where you've got a pastor who talks for five minutes about the Word of God and then 20 minutes about your wallet, you need to, you need to change the dial. There's a lot of churches that it always seems to be about money, and they're always like pressuring the people to give, and, and it really it grieves my heart. Now, maybe today's your first day here, and, and you haven't been to church in a long time, and you're thinking, you know what, I knew it, I knew I shouldn't have come, because I knew they were going to talk about money. Let me, just, let me just ease your mind. We go book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and, and you just happened to be here when we came to this spot. I won't be back in this book on a Sunday morning for, for probably eight years, but for some reason, God wanted you here today to hear these things. There's nothing wrong with giving, but I am just, I'm just appalled by the people who beg for money and act like God is going bankrupt. Listen, our God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He owns everything. He's not going bankrupt. And where God guides, God provides. And when I hear these guys on TV that are like saying, you know, well, if you don't give, we're shutting down this ministry. I'm like, good, shut it down. Because all you guys are is about merchandising and, and, and making money. But 
because so many have been offended about that begging for money, then there's those that go the other extreme and they don't ever want you to talk about money. But we're going through the scripture, we've come to giving, and we're going to talk about it. Giving is something that every Christian should want to do. Why? Because God gave his best, his son for you and me. Jesus gave his all. And everything that we have comes from the Father. Every gift, every perfect gift comes down from the Father of light. So everything we have is his anyway. And he says, listen, you know, here, use it and then use some of it to bless others. Whether that's of your material things, your, your earnings, or your time, you should be giving to others. God was a giver. We should be givers. I like what Pastor Jason always says is that he says, uh, giving is an act of worship. It's part of our worship to give. Now, I always hear people talk about, you know, how God's transformed their life. God, you know, God's done amazing things in my life. He's transformed everything in my life except my wallet. God wants all of you. God wants you to have a heart to give. But if you don't feel good about it, or it bothers you, or even it makes you angry, keep it. Keep it. God has given you an opportunity to bless others and to bless him by your giving. Listen, you can't take anything with you, but you can send it ahead. You can send it ahead. And God is looking for a cheerful giver. You know, the problem with Christians and giving is that we're selfish. We're selfish people. But here's the thing. Every time we give, we give away a little bit of our selfishness. And we do it because we see the bigger picture. Now, this isn't a carnal pep rally to get you to give at this church. There's never been any pressure. I've never begged any of you guys for money. We make, we make situations known to you, so if it's on your heart, you pray about it, and you want to give, but we have never asked you, begged you. It, it's always between you and God. And if, and, and, and if you have a home church, you should support that home church. That's just biblical. If you don't feel like this is your home church and you're not being fed here, then I want to encourage you, find another church where you feel like you're being fed and give there. Because I don't want you to miss out on the blessing of giving. Because you can't outgive God. I know if God wants to shut this church down, there's nothing I can do about that. If he wants it to stay open, there's nothing you can do to keep it closed. And so I want you to feel blessed wherever you might go to church. And where, if that church is feeding you, bless that church. Support them. Now, the question is always, how much should we give? Well, that's a big question. I like what it says here. It says, now, concerning the collections of the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do you, upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God has prospered him, that there would be no gatherings when I come. And when I come, whosoever you shall approve by your letters, them will I send to bring your liberality unto Jerusalem. And if it be fit that I go also, they shall go with me. So what is going on here? What's going on here is a situation where the Jerusalem church is suffering. And Paul wants to do a, a wonderful Christian uh, uh, move here to show the unity of the body of Christ, to show the love, and there's something amazing happening there. He wants the churches in these areas to put forth an offering to help Jerusalem. Now, you're probably saying, well, if Jerusalem's suffering, Steve, I thought you just said where God guides, God provides. He does, but he's going to use these other churches to help provide for Jerusalem. See, Jerusalem wasn't doing anything wrong. They weren't begging for money. They weren't making merchandise of people. They were doing the right thing. But God allowed them to suffer financially to give an opportunity to the rest of the body of Christ to give. There's a blessing in giving. And so what had gone, what had gone wrong was when, when the church was birthed at Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, what happened, it was primarily made up of Jews who had become Christians. 
And when the Gentiles got saved, they're like, whoa, wait a minute. No way, Gentiles are only good for fueling hell. They're dogs. They, they can't be Christians. And God had to do this amazing work to just show that, that he died for everyone and, and that when you become a Christian, you're no longer Jew or Gentile, woman or man, bond or free. You're one in Christ. And, and God wanted to bring that unity, but that was really hard when you've been trained all your life that Gentiles are dogs to now think Gentile lives matter. Well, that caught you all, didn't it? And what, what the Lord was doing here is he thought this, this would be an amazing gesture that if the Gentile church at large all brought forth offerings and came and laid it at the feet of the church in Jerusalem said, we love you and we did this for you, that it would, it would tear down the walls between the Jew and Gentile Christian and show the unity and the love in the body of Christ. And that was the purpose And so he says, I want you to take this collection. I want you to give. Now, he's also going to let us know that this is an offering that was in addition to their normal offering. He's going to let them know, if you look at the Greek and the way it's written, this is an additional offering, that this shouldn't affect their normal giving. And that's important for us to understand. We should give on a regular basis. He says on the first day of the week, that's when you gather when you're Sunday, on a Sunday. So the question is, how much do we give? Well, the Old Testament says that there was tithes and offerings, a tenth, and then anything above that was an offering. That's how the Old Testament put it. But here in Corinthians, he says, as God has prospered you. You see, when you look into the New Testament, you won't find anywhere where we're commanded to tithe. That's an Old Testament thing, and and what happened was that that was a command given by God, the statutes and the ordinance under the law, for them to give a tenth and offerings. And a matter of fact, if you look in Leviticus, it talks about three tenths. That's 30%. That's even, wow, you're like, whoa, wait a minute. But these were the things that God established back then. So if if you were in the Old Testament and you were a Jew, you made $100, 10 was God's. It was non-negotiable. Anything after that, you could do a special offering, something above and beyond. That was your thing. But when you come to the New Testament, Paul says in Colossians that those statutes and those ordinances and those commandments were done away when Jesus Christ died on the cross. We're no longer under the law. But certainly, we are called to give in the New Testament. We are called to give. How do we give? We give as we have been prospered. See, the beautiful thing about that is that being that we're under grace now, being that we're not under the law, though we keep the commandments more than ever before because we understand God's grace, and if you love him, you'll keep his commandments, that this frees us up to give not just a tenth, but as God has prospered us. So it, it opens up a wider area that we can do way more than even was required, and, and, and if you don't have the ability Don't feel guilty that you can't give. Do what you can. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 says, But this I say, He which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he that soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man, according as he has purposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity for God loves a cheerful giver. So he says, let every man give according to how God has prospered him. How has God prospered you? To give accordingly. That's important for us to do. Is there something wrong with giving a tenth? No. God put it on my heart, and for me, I start with a tenth, and then I go above and beyond as situations pop up. I'm not under the law. I don't have to do that. But that's if if God's purposed in your heart to give a tenth, then that's what you should be doing. If God has purposed in your heart to give more, then that's what you should be doing. Now, if you're coming to this church, you're married, you got kids, and you're you're making like thirty thousand a year, you're not making ends meet. We we don't expect you to be able to give because you don't have the money to give. But you can give of yourself. You can serve in the church. You can help out a neighbor. You can do ministry. 
But then on the other hand, if, if you're making millions of dollars, I don't want you to replace, oh, well, I serve on Sunday, that's why I don't give. Because now what you're doing is you're charging God thousands of dollars an hour to come serve on a Sunday morning. So let every man give as God purposes in their heart and how God has prospered them. So you should be praying about these things. See, some, some Christians are in a position where they have more. They can give more. Listen, if you're here today and you make $100 million a year, we don't want a tenth, we want half. I mean, if you can't live off $50 million, you're messed up. So God has prospered certain people where they're able to give more. And that's the beauty of what he's talking about here. I think that um, every one of us should pray ahead of time before we come to church what we're going to give. So that you're not pressured by somebody that stands over a pulpit. I am blown away by what I've witnessed over the years in some churches where a pastor will go, the Holy Spirit just spoke to me. There's three people in this church that are going to give $5,000 each. Stand up, be recognized. Run out of that church as fast as you can. That is not the Holy Spirit. God wants a cheerful giver. He doesn't want a pressured giver. He doesn't want a guilt trip giver. If you don't want to give, keep it. Go buy lunch. It's between you and the Lord. It's not, it's not, it has nothing to do with me. But my question to you, and the question that I give myself, is what I give to God, what does it cost me? Right? If you got that family that's just struggling every month to make ends meet, they got kids, they're, not, they're having trouble paying their bills, if they drop $5 into the basket as it goes around, that's like the widow's might. That would be Jesus just saying, that person just gave more than everybody else because they didn't have it to give. What does your giving cost you? If you're making millions of dollars and you, you throw a 20 in, you tip your waitresses better than that. What, that didn't cost you anything. King David, when he was going to purchase Mount Moriah to build the temple, he approached the man who owned that land, and he said, I want to buy this. And that guy was so freaked out over the angel he just witnessed with his kids, the miraculous that happened. He was so freaked out. He said, you know what? Take the land. I'll give you an altar. I'll give you, I'll give you animals. Just, it's yours. Free. Now, you and I would have jumped at that and said, praise the Lord, I got that free. But you know what David said? Check this out. He said, I'm not going to give anything to God that didn't cost me something. What is your giving costing you? Your giving of your time? your material things, your earnings. You can't outgive God. He loves a cheerful giver. See the bigger picture. Pray about it. And whatever God puts on your heart, you know what I always do? I, I just throw in a little bit more. I just want to go a little above and beyond because you know what? He went a little above and beyond for me. In verse 2 where he says, Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him, notice he says, every one of you lay by him in store as God has prospered him that there be no gatherings when I come. And so Paul is saying that this is something that's additional into your normal giving. And, and God doesn't want people to be pressured. And so what Paul does, he says, listen, you guys do this before I even get there. Because I don't want to get there and then just see like this rally and this parade to, you know, the pump up. To you. Come on, people, dig deep. Apostle Paul's right here. You know, I mean, he doesn't want any of that. He wants you to be moved in your heart on how you give and not pressured by some pastor standing behind the pulpit telling you to give. Paul didn't want them to be pressured by his presence. You ever get around somebody who's like 
really being used by God, and you kind of act a little different, you know, you're kind of like talking to him, you're trying to like really be a little more spiritual. Oh, wait, not you guys, that's just me, right? You know, I mean, you kind of want to impress them, you know, because they're, they're, God's been using them mightily, and you're just kind of like, you know, I'm holy too, and you know, I just want to be used, and we act different around those kinds of people. If Franklin Graham was here, we'd all be acting different, right? Unfortunately, that's not what he wants. We should act that way all the time. <clears throat> but my point is this. Let's just say today we had a special guest speaker, the Apostle Paul. That'd be awesome, wouldn't it? I mean, this guy has seen God face to face. He's been to heaven, I mean, and all this stuff. And man, him coming here, wrote most of the New Testament, and we have special guest, Apostle Paul, and during worship, Austin's playing worship, and, and all of a sudden you're, you're sitting here in the front, right? And, and the Apostle Paul just comes and sits right next to you. You're like, yeah. And then the offering happens. What are you going to do when the offering goes by? You're going to write a check. You're, even if that check bounces, you're writing a check, and you're throwing a couple of zeros on there. You're like, Paul, you know, check. Yeah, I'm giving. Paul didn't want any kind of pressure like that. He wants you to give with a pure heart. And I say to you today, if you don't have it on your heart to give, then don't. But if God's been talking to you, listen. And make sure that you give with a cheerful heart. He then in verse 3 he says, And when I come, whomsoever you shall approve by your letters... Then will I send to bring the liberality unto Jerusalem. And if it be fitting that I go also, they shall go with me. And so Paul understands the importance of accountability. That when uh, he's, he's asking to receive this offering from all these different churches. And he wants to be above reproach. So he says, listen, send a couple of guys from each one of your churches to go to Jerusalem to lay the offering at their feet. If you want me to go with you, I'll go. That's great. What is he showing? He's showing accountability. Why? Because, you know, the Corinth church, the Corinthian church was messed up. They were stealing from one another, suing one another, and he knew that there would be somebody in that church that says, oh, yeah, we're putting together this offering. Yeah, Paul's taking it to Jerusalem. Sure he is, sure he is. We'll see how much really gets there. You know, Paul, he'll stop off in Italy and get one of those little Italian chariots with the spinning whim, real rims and, you know, surround sound and wet bar, and that money won't even make it. Paul's covered everything. He says, you know what, if you don't feel good about me taking it, point a couple of people. If you want me to go, I'll go. That's accountability. That's a, that's a good thing. Paul was desiring to bring the Jews and the Gentiles together. And that was his whole purpose. And so he asked for this collection. And then in verse 5, he says this. He says, now I'm going to come unto you when I shall pass through Macedonia. I, for I do pass through Macedonia. And it may be that I will abide, yea, it, and winter with you, that you may bring me on my journey whithersoever I go. For I will not see you now, by the way, but I trust and tarry a while, that I'll tarry a while with you if the Lord permits. But I will tarry in Ephesus until Pentecost, for there's a great door, and effectual is opened unto me, and there are many adversaries. This is a, a great portion of Scripture for every one of us who sets plans. There's nothing wrong with making plans if the Lord permits it. That's the key. Paul understood something, that we can have all these ideas of what we're going to do, where we're going to go, and they're good things, they're godly things, but is it the Lord's will? And so Paul, understanding that, says, I'm going to come unto you, I plan on doing it, you know, I'm going to pass through Macedonia, I, I hope to win her with you guys, if the Lord permits. Proverbs 3 says this, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. It's his timing. It's his timing. And, and he doesn't say that when he guides you to go somewhere that it's going to go smooth. He doesn't say it's going to be easy. He doesn't say it's going to be without troubles. In verse 7, 
where he says, For I will not see you now, by the way, but I trust to tarry with you, uh, while with you, if the Lord permits. That's how we got to finish all of our prayers. At the end of all your prayers, even as you make your petitions, even they're good things or they might not be, they might be selfish things, at the end of your prayers say this, not my will, but thy will be done. That's what all of us should be saying. If the Lord permits, Paul understood that. We need to learn flexibility in our walk. I like what Pastor Chuck said. He said, blessed are the flexible, they shall not be broken. Are you flexible in your walk with Jesus Christ? Because I know some people, there's nothing wrong with making plans, but I know people that make their plans for their whole day, and if something doesn't go according to the plan, they're a mess. They have a meltdown. Um, But as a believer, that's our life. We make all of our plans, and then I pray, Lord, just come and mess up all my plans. Because I want to be in his will and not my will. And we need to be flexible. When we learn flexibility, what really shows growth in our lives is when God changes our plans and we roll with it. You might be planning on going somewhere or doing something, and it's a good thing, and God says, no. And we roll with it. Because if we try to force it, we're only going to get frustrated and burned out. Do you know that when your plans get messed up, that God gives opportunity for his will to be done? You always look at it like it's a bad thing. To be flexible will spare spare yourself from frustration. You know, it's funny. um, I was thinking all week about just telling you guys this story, just like, Picture yourself, you got your plans, you're going to town, you got to take care of these things, and then all of a sudden your, your car breaks down, and you're, you're just, you lose it. I had an appointment, I had these plans, all this stuff was going on, and you, you, you've been in those situations, right? I can't believe this is happening now. And then God uses it as an opportunity because the tow truck driver comes to help you, and, and then he's all broken up. You lead him to the Lord, and isn't that worth it? So I was thinking about sharing that with you all week, and then yesterday I was in Kapa'a, and I locked my keys in my car when I was ready to go home. I never do that. And, you know, you got to wait for an hour for the tow truck driver to come, and, and, and I just thought to myself, you know what, um, maybe, maybe God just spared me from getting in an accident. Try to look at it differently from God's perspective. See the opportunities that he's laying before you. You know, the the, the amazing thing I see here with Paul is is Paul was an apostle. He saw Jesus. He spoke to Jesus face to face. He was caught up into heaven. He saw things that he couldn't even describe. He wrote more of the epistles of the Bible than any of the New Testament than anybody. And he still wasn't sure about God's timing. That encourages me. I mean, I had plans in April to go to the Philippines to break ground to build a church. We've got a church out there. We just don't have a building. But that wasn't God's plan. Is it his plan to build a church there? Absolutely. But my timing was different than his timing. He knows the perfect timing. And when you look at the Apostle Paul that was doing amazing things and how he wanted to go here and he wanted to go there and the Holy Spirit did forbid him from going there and you know God was redirecting him. Are you redirectable? Or are you just determined to do what you want to do? Got to be flexible. If you're not flexible in the kingdom of God, you'll get frustrated. In 1 Corinthians um, chapter 13, Just a couple pages back, verse 12, he says, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. Right now, we 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 see dimly the big picture. We don't see super clearly everything that God wants to do. But one day we will. 
in our new bodies. Right now, we, we know in part. And it's that in part that God puts in us to get us to start moving into action. But then we have to wait for his next instructions. We can't jump the gun. And if he says go, we go. And if he says not now, that means not now. We can't force it either way. We need to be driven by the Spirit. And we can relate to these things today in our own lives. In verse 10 he says, well actually let's, let's back up a little bit because I want to touch on this. Verse 9 of verse 8. But I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost, for a great door and effectual is opened unto me, and there are many adversaries. I, I think we should talk about these two verses. Paul is hanging out in Ephesus. Why? Because a great door has been opened for him to do ministry. But he adds, there's a lot of opposition. And I need to say that to you because when you decide in your heart to step out and serve Jesus, guess what? opposition. Some of you experienced it just coming to church. Opposition. Kids get stirred up. You and the wife start fighting. You know, you're arguing all the way to church. You're screaming at each other. You pull in the parking lot. You open up the door. You see the greeter at the front door. You're like, oh, praise the Lord, brother. <laughs> Your family's looking at you like, who's this guy? The enemy knows if he can cause opposition before you get here that will stop you from coming here, he will give you opposition every single week. That's why I just say, I don't care if you're fighting, screaming, I don't care if you don't even feel like a Christian, just get in the car, get here. You will never regret it. But whenever you say, listen, I'm going to step out, I'm going to start serving the church, guess what's going to happen? Opposition. I'm going to go on a missions trip, guess what's going to happen? Opposition. Because the enemy knows if he can bring opposition in your life, you will turn away from doing anything for Jesus. But understand this. When you say, I'm going forward for Jesus, be ready. Be ready. Be ready. See, I think we got to live our life each and every day Nothing wrong with making a plan. But we have to live our life with an attitude of, I'm ready to have my day disturbed. Right? I'm ready for disruption in my day. See, if I'm ready and waiting for a disruption in my day and my plans and my schedule, then when I, my day is disrupted, I won't be taken off guard. If I'm ready to go forward and serve Jesus, to get to church, to do ministry, to go on the mission field, and I'm ready for opposition, I'm going to be praying up the armor of God. Paul says in verse 10, he says, Now if Timotheus come, see that he may be with you without fear, for he worketh the work of the Lord, as I also do. Let no man therefore despise him, but conduct him forth in peace, that he may come unto you, for I look for him with the brethren. Timothy was Paul's son in the faith. He was the only one that had a heart for the church like Paul, just like Paul. Timothy was very timid. The church of Corinth was out of control. And so to Paul to look at Timothy, who's kind of timid, a little sickly, he's young, he feels like people don't think anything of him because he's, he's young, he's you know, going to be despised. And Paul says, ah, you know what, let me warm you up. I'll throw you into the Corinthian church. Let me throw you to the wolves. You'll get that all out of your system right away. And he's got to warn the Corinthians that I'm sending this boy, you guys treat him right. Because why? Because they were acting like they were better than everybody else. And, and Paul wanted them to be blessed, and he was sending Timothy because Timothy was a blessing to Paul, and he wanted Timothy to be a blessing to them. He says, As touching our brother Apollos, I greatly desired him to come unto you, 
with the brethren, but his will was not at all to come at this time, but he will come when he shall have a convenient time. I, I like this because Apollos is asked by Paul to come to the Corinthian church. Now, you remember in the beginning, there was this division in the Corinthian church. They were saying, well, I'm of, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas. And they were arguing who was better and everything and acting like, you know, you know this guy's better than this guy. And, oh, Apollos is way better than Paul. And, and Paul was trying to share with them, um, you know what? We're not all divided. Stop dividing. God has sent all of us here to be a blessing to you. And Paul was expressing his love for Apollos and Peter. Well, he's like, I'm, we're not divided. Why are you guys divided? And, and here's like the proof of it right here. Paul is trying to get Apollos to come to, the, to Corinth to bless the church. But Apollos says, I'm not going to come at this time. I'll come at a more convenient time. I like that. Why? Because as a pastor, sometimes I can get spread thin. You get people that ask you, can you come speak at our church? Can you come speak at this conference? Can you come to our men's breakfast? Can you come to our special Bible study? Can you come here? Can you come there? And, and I can find myself starting to jump on all of these opportunities and running myself ragged and going and speaking here and there and everywhere and start neglecting the home church. And, and so I get asked to so many different things that I had to get to a place where I could just say, no, I can't do it. I can't be at everybody's meeting. I can't be at all these things. I have to be led by the Lord. And I love that because you see Apollos saying, you know, I can't come right now. But, um, you know, in a sense, Lord willing, I'll come later on. And, and Paul doesn't give him a hard time about it. Paul wasn't interested in doing the work of the Holy Spirit in a person's life. Paul gave his input to Apollos, probably by the Spirit of God. He, he puts out his counsel, but he left it between him and the Lord so that he would learn to listen to God, that he would learn to hear from God. I'm not, I make a lousy Holy Spirit. You make a lousy Holy Spirit. But we say things to each other, and then we let you hear from God. Because Paul was interested in them listening and being led by God and not by Paul. In verse 13, he says, Watch you, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong, let all things be done with love. Great two verses right here. Great encouragement, especially for this time, he says, for us to watch. We, we live in crazy times. Are you guys watching what's going on? Are you, are you comparing it to what the Bible says, what's going to happen in the end times? Do you feel like we're right down to the wire? Do you feel like when, when, when we were shut down months ago that that was the kickoff to the last game? I feel like that. And we want to finish well. We want to go out swinging for Jesus. We don't want to go out just giving him our all. And so he says here in verse 13, watch. Watch. What does he mean? He means be vigilant. To be spiritually aware of what's going on around you. Why? Because Satan wants to devour you. Don't you understand that? The enemy wants to sift you like wheat. And the more you go forward for Jesus, the attacks can get stronger. But Jesus is worth it. Hang in there. Pray up the armor. 1 Peter 5.8 says this, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. And so Peter actually makes the second thing that we see in verse 13, stand fast in the faith. So we are to be watching, we are to stand fast, in the faith. What does that mean? No retreat. Plain and simple. Nowhere in the Bible do you see retreat. You see stand fast, you see walk, and you see run. But you will not find anywhere where a Christian is called to retreat. We are called to put on the whole armor of God. The whole armor of God covers every part of the body except one spot. What spot? The back. Why? Jesus got your back. You turn your back on Jesus, you're in trouble. Fiery darts, boom, no armor. We are to 
Stand fast in the faith. Number three, he says, quit like men. That's King James. Act like men. This is to you guys. Act like men. What's he saying? Stop being childish. He's saying to the Corinthians, stop being childish. Stop dividing. Act like men. And fourth, he says, be strong. That means being strong spiritually, being an example to others. Men, are you an example to others? Ladies, are you an example to the girls? We want to be an example pleasing unto God. And verse 14 says, let all these things be done with what? Love. With love. Everything we do has to be covered in love or else we're a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. We're just a noise. Verse 15, he says, I beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanos, that he is the first fruits of Ikea, and that they have devoted themselves to the ministry of the saints. Now, you've got a translation. How many have devoted there? Okay, I got the King James. I just read devoted. I like the way the King James read it, reads it. Check this out. They are the first fruits of Achaia, and they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. Addicted. I love that. If you're going to be addicted to something, be addicted to the ministry of the saints, to serving Jesus, right? You know why I love this? Because I was an addict. And some of you were too. I know your stories. You lived in the world. You were addicted to immorality, drugs and alcohol, violence. And you know what's beautiful is when God got a hold of your heart, now you're addicted to Jesus. I mean, when we lived in the world, we didn't do it 100%. We did it 200%. And when you get a hold of somebody with that radical of addiction and you get their heart to Jesus, oh, man, that person's on fire. you got to hold them back. Because they are addicted to the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. I like that. Woo! You want to get around those kind of people. Catch that little addiction. Tell somebody, hey, you know, when they see the joy in your heart, and they're like, dude, what are you on? You go, hey, I'll take you to my connect. Meet me in front of the Kilauea Theater at 930. I'll hook you up. He says in verse 16 that you submit yourselves unto such and to everyone that helpeth with us and laboreth. So he's sending these guys out and he says, you know what, these are good guys. Um, You know, submit yourself unto such. I am glad of the coming of Stephanus. So now these guys are coming. Stephanus and Fortunatus. Fortunatus. I mean, what kind of name is that for a little boy? I don't know. I, what did they look? When that kid was born, did they look down and they go, well, that looks like a Fortunatus to me. <laughs> yeah, Fortunatus. I'm probably not saying it right. It's probably like Fortunatus or something like Fortunatus. I digress. Okay. He says, I'm glad of the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaicus. For that which was lacking on your part, they have supplied. For they have refreshed my spirit and yours. Therefore, acknowledge you them that are such. I like that because, see, what they lacked in Corinth, these guys coming from Corinth to bring the letter to Paul, refresh Paul. And and that is such a great thing when you have people that are a refreshment around you. May I ask you, is when people get around you, are you a refreshment? These are guys that were builder-uppers. They weren't terror-downers. Are you somebody that when you get around people that you build up, you refresh, you encourage? Or are you somebody that's always tearing people down? We should check our hearts on that. I would pray that you would be an refreshment, that you would be a breath of fresh air when you're around people especially in these times, how important for us to encourage one another. In verse 19, he says, The churches of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you. Much in the Lord with the church and in our house. 
All the brethren greet you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Okay, well, we're in COVID, so we're not going to do that. Now, the interesting thing is, um, I remember years ago, our pastor that we got saved, the church we got saved in, um, Pastor Lyle, he, he, um, he preached on this one week, greet each other with a holy kiss, and, and then it was like everybody got out of control. And, and so they were all like, like, you know, it was like mopping going on, you know what I mean? Two weeks later, he had to preach, stop doing that. <laughs> Can you imagine if after worship, you know, Austin didn't say greet one another, but he said greet each other with a holy kiss? You know what you guys would be doing, you young girls and young guys? You'd be strategically placing yourself in the church. Oh, I didn't know you were there. Right? So we'll just do a handshake, a hug, fist bump, whatever. Paul says, 21, this salutation of Paul with my own hand. So uh, he, had, he was dictating this letter. And then he signs it in his own handwriting. He had eye problems, and so big letters for Paul. He said, if, this is a heavy verse right here. If any man love not the Lord, Jesus Christ, let him be anathema, maranatha. Let me read it again. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him go to hell. Come, Lord Jesus. Wow. See, there's going to come a time where God's not going to play any more games. And he's going to call his church out. And if you didn't accept Jesus, you're going through the tribulation. And I would hope that you would give your life there. Because you will actually give your physical life to serve Jesus in the tribulation. And I talk to people and they say, you know, if everything you're saying is true, I'm, I'm not buying in this Jesus thing, but if you guys all disappear then I'll know what you're saying is true, and then I'll give my life to Jesus in the tribulation. Listen, read the book of Revelation. Read chapter 6 through 19. Um, If you have trouble giving your life to Jesus now, you think it's going to be easy then. Why don't you just spare yourself all the headaches and the nightmares and just choose Jesus now? He says, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let me close with this. Paul wrote this letter. It was a corrective letter. But the Bible says, faithful are the wounds of a friend. If any of the stuff that you have read is convicting your heart, do something about it. If a friend comes to you and says, what are you doing? Receive them. Paul gave this letter. It was a correction letter. They were out of control. But he did it. Why? Because he loves them. If you see a friend falling by the wayside, don't let him fall. Go after him. Encourage him. Tell him, listen, don't don't act like you're better than them. Don't go and say, listen, look, I know what you're doing. You don't need to do that because they already know what they're doing. They need someone that will put their arm around them and say, listen, I love you, and I know that I could be going through right what you're going through right now, and I know that if it was me going through it, you would come to me and help me. We've got to stop this whole, I'm better than you, and boy, I'm walking with Christ. What are you doing, you loser? Because people are doing that to one another. They're acting like they're better. Oh, I'm better. I give at the church. I serve at the church. But your heart is so far from God. Your works, you you think that makes up for your crummy attitude and your finger pointing. Listen, this is a time right now that you need to understand that you are only blessed and in the place that you are by the grace of God And he has forgiven you of so much and nobody else needed the blood of Jesus more than you. And you need to see those people that are hurting, who have fallen away, that just needs a brother or sister to put their arm around and say, listen, I love you and I'm going to help you through this. Because you know what? Jesus would leave the 99 for the one. So my encouragement for you today is to finish well. I think we're in the last days. 
I don't think we have much time. Let's turn it up a notch for Jesus. Amen? Let's pray.